Good afternoon. So we we opened this session on uh, mainstreaming forgotten food into Africa. What are the next big things? So we will have uh, uh, three presentations on the on the theme, uh, and then we will have uh, a high level panel discussion uh, with uh, four panelists that will join us here on the floor. I I like to just give a brief introduction. Uh, I was going to say on behalf of FARA, but actually I can do it on behalf of FARA because FARA and GFAR are working together. And in particular, this, uh, this action is part of a global uh, manifesto on forgotten foods that we worked out with, with FARA and with other regional uh, uh, research fora. So the, the few words that I wanted to say, uh, uh, in addition to thanking FARA for this initiative and thanking Biodiversity and, and SIAT uh, uh, is just to focus on what we really want to mainstream. So we do want to mainstream forgotten foods. So the material, the material uh, goods and the material benefits that are related to forgotten foods. Uh, and we know, and we will hear much more about nutrition, about uh, biodiversity, about resilience. But we also want to mainstream something else, because when we think of forgotten foods, we should always think of forgotten knowledge and forgotten people, because they're connected to forgotten foods. So we want to also mainstream forgotten knowledge and uh, place at the center, because maybe mainstream is not the verb, place at the center forgotten people. And I think this is very much our idea, and I would encourage all the speakers to uh, try in addition to the marketing aspects, economic aspects, and other aspects, to emphasize these two dimensions, which have to do with two important things. Uh, one is the empowerment. So when we're talking about forgotten people, we're talking of people that don't have a say in the decision-making processes. So we want to empower them. And there is a subtle dimension there that we always have to keep in mind. Then when you are um, relegated to the role of producer of millet, you are not recognized as producer of knowledge. So maybe that is, the, as an, is an important shift that we have to make. So the empowerment comes with a self-awareness, self-recognition of being also a producer of knowledge. And if I am in a producer of knowledge, I'm also an actor of research. I'm not anymore a recipient of technologies and a recipient of advice from outside. I become an actor. And that's a, a very important dimension that goes under empowerment. I feel I can have a say. I feel I can really take my place. And that's something that I would like to emphasize. So, so mainstreaming forgotten foods means also empowering farmers. And in addition, of course, to all the other benefits that are fundamental. And the second dimension, which is related to forgotten knowledge, is a transformation of the agricultural research and innovation system. Because as GFA, this is our ultimate target. So we want to see, and I'm sure FARA has also this ambition, we want to see that we really move into a multi-stakeholder uh, partnership dimension. And what does that mean? That means that we are changing the governance of the system. We, are, we, are, we want farmers to be sitting in places where in addition to being recognized, they can contribute. And although maybe some still have reservation regarding these words, they can be researchers with bare feet. Researchers this is not my word, it's the word of Enda. Researchers with bare feet. And recognizing them as uh, uh, experimenters, as, uh, as researchers is, is, is fundamental for the change of the system. So these are the, just the opening consideration that I would like to give, and I hope throughout our discussion we will be able to, uh, to address these three dimensions. So the material dimension of forgotten foods, which is fundamental, economic, uh, agronomic, etc. The empowerment dimension, which is also very important, and the dimension of the transformation of the, the much needed transformation of research and innovation systems which is really the heart of the matter. And, and I conclude by saying, yes, we do need new technologies. Yes, we do need innovations, but perhaps we need new processes. And we haven't perhaps spent enough time in these new processes that we often define as co-innovation, co-research. 
And it's important that we look at the forgotten food mainstreaming as an opportunity for moving faster towards co-innovation and co-research. So with these words, I'd like to call uh, uh, Dr. Carlo Fadda to give us the first presentation on the, on the theme of today, which is uh, mainstreaming forgotten food. What are the next big steps? Carlo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Alessandro, for uh, the introduction and the, tra the introductory uh, remarks, which has been very comprehensive in terms of uh, uh, identifying really the complexity uh, as a way to for the presentation to be put up, please. Let me introduce myself. So my name is Carlo Fard. I work for the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SEAR, where I'm leading a research area on biodiversity for food and agriculture. So you can understand why I'm so much interested in the topic of forgotten food. And I'm also, for those who are familiar with the one CGIER form, I'm also leading one initiative, which is called Nature Positive Solutions for Sustainable Agriculture, in which, again, the forgotten food play quite a vital role. Um, and that is implemented in, uh, in five countries. And, um, and uh, it is... Uh, really about diversification, co-creation, co-development of solutions, uh, promoting the marketing of forgotten food. So, so I will be talking about what is the next big thing for forgotten foods and, and why Africa needs them. And, and that's really a personal perspective. And I also want to be a little bit provocative in my my remarks, because I think that that probably will trigger the, the debate before. So first of all, the challenges, we all know about this, deforestation, pollution and waste, climate change. And we know that a large part of deforestation is determined by agriculture, 80% actually. And that is linked, of course, with the loss of biodiversity, wild species, soil degradation, etc. We also know that agriculture uh, is an important part of pollution and waste of soil, water, air, and, and that happens through, for example, eutrophication when excessive use of fertilizer is used or residues of chemicals that are damaging our health. And then of course, climate change, climate change is partly caused by agriculture, depending on the statistics you use, between one fourth and one third of all the greenhouse gas is emitted by agriculture. But agriculture is also a victim of climate change because this uh, reduces the productivity of the crops, displaces people, and, and so reduces the viability of generally production systems. And when we account for all of this, just looking at the environmental accounts of, 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 of agriculture for Africa. Deforestation alone, there are 3.4 million hectares that are lost every year because of agriculture, just in Africa. And the cost of it is including the, the loss of timber, biodiversity, ecosystem services is calculated to be around 6 billion. The soil erosion, it's... Uh, Evaluate, evaluated to be around 68 billion in reduced crop yields, in the cost of the fertilizer, in the loss of agricultural land when the land become not usable anymore. The water scarcity, there are not real, uh, real uh, uh, estimates, but according to the UN, uh, that could affect, could impact up to 5% of GDP. I live in Kenya, I come from Kenya, and there has been about six consecutive years of drought and the impact for food security, livelihood, et cetera, has been tremendous. 
Desertification and land degradation, this according to the African Union, is a 9 billion losses. The loss of biodiversity uh, is not has been estimated, but according to some papers, it amounts to several billion dollars. And finally, climate change can impact 1 to 3% of African GDP by 2030. So we can be confident in saying that the cost of environmental degradation in which agriculture plays such an important role is more than 100 billion per year. And then we need to look at uh, uh, the food and how Africa depends on, 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 on different type of the food security and the food dependence. Africa imports, for, and we heard throughout this uh, meeting, imports about $44 billion of wheat, maize, rice, vegetable oils, meat, sugar. And we know that with the current uh, crisis, the, the current crisis with, with Ukraine, the COVID, that number have been gone up, including the cost of, of, of this food, uh, the valuation of many currencies, et cetera, et cetera. We know that in Africa, about 20% of the people, and this is FAO telling us, or about 250 million people are undernourished, of which WFP goes a little bit uh, deep, diving a little bit deeper into those numbers, 87 million face acute food insecurity. And according to the Global Nutrition Report, 35.2% of the African children are stunted. Now this is one of there is one out of three, and that impaired their capacity to develop and, and to really achieve their full potential as, as adult. To me, it's terrible. I'm a father, and if I would think that my children cannot achieve their full potential, and I see all the children in Africa, and I think one out of three will not do that. I mean, it's really, I mean, we are, we are robbing them of our future. We go in Nairobi and we think, uh, what is the problem? Oh, criminality, pity, but we are, we are robbing the future of these people. That, that is what we should, we should consider. The problem is not the criminal. The problem is a system that prevent one third of the children of this continent to achieve their full potential. Mm -hmm. And we have 75% of the food insecure people are exposed to adverse weather. So this food insecurity is so much interlinked with climate change. And we know all of this. I mean, what are the factors? We know all of them. Poverty, obviously it doesn't, uh, people rely on natural resources, they encroach on, on those natural resources. Climate change and the environment, we mentioned it, uh, it leads to uh, reduced productivity, uh, environmental degradation, the limited productivity, but that's a kind of, circular aspect where you have limited productivity because the soil is degraded, the environment is degraded, and, and also lack of uh, appropriate technologies. Of course. We have conflict and instability, which make people insecure to invest in a better environment. So I think if you, if you, have, to, if you have to plant trees, for example, develop agroforestry system, regenerate your soils, and you don't know if tomorrow you're going to be there because maybe something happens uh, and then you need to move. Population growth and, and urbanization, uh, limited market access and trade barriers. And I would like to emphasize this trade barriers element because now with the AFTA, uh, probably those is going to improve. And I really hope that that will give, uh, and we will discuss this later, uh, how much uh, we need to have these trade barriers reduced. Gender inequality, a number of studies uh, reporting on the importance of gender, and yet women do not have access to technology, do not have access to seeds, they do not have access to finance. And so their potential to contribute to improve food and nutrition security is undermined by the fact that they are disadvantaged. Inadequate agricultural development policies, they focus on, uh, on, on, on a very mainstream uh, approach and 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 so and they don't provide incentives for uh, addressing the challenges of food insecurity. So let me go on the uh, why then the forgotten crops. First of all, because they can address all of them. We discuss about the environment, health, social, and when you look at the African crops, they have the potential. The potential. They don't do it, but they have the potential. 
to improve food and nutrition security. They can increase resilience to climate change. Why is that? Because agriculture in Africa didn't come in the, in the past two, three centuries. It came thousands of years ago. And when thousands of years ago, Them very adapted even to the variability that we observe today. But we need to study that. It can improve the livelihoods of the people. And we will hear from uh, the panelists later on how that works. It can cover all needs of a balanced diet. There has been, uh, uh, for the Forgotten Manifesto for Africa that uh, Alessandro and Fatumbi has been working on, at least 121 species have been described. They provide food in different seasons. The cropping calendar is different. They mention oil crops, cereals, legumes, fruits, vegetables. What a beautiful basket for a balanced diet is that. So that's, but I think the key word there is potential. So it's potential because there are constraints. There is limited investment in forgotten crops from far to far, Li limited investment on research, limited investment on uh, uh, supporting the producers, limited, li limited investment in supporting the private sector to invest in those crops. So and a limited uh, investment in giving the awareness of the consumers about the benefits of these forgotten crops. So why people should consume? Where is the market? There is no demand, but not because the people don't want it, but it's because there is no awareness. They don't know, particularly in the urban area. There is limited investment in post-harvest processing consumption. There is a lack of consumer education, and there is a lack, as a result, a lack of interest from the private sector because they don't see the business for that. Yet, and that's my final slide, Forgotten crops, in my view, and I've been in Africa for, I spent 20 years of my life in Africa. Already? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, really, I, I really would like to see an African renaissance during, during my time. It's an renaissance opportunity for all the stakeholders that Alessandro has been mentioning earlier. It should enable African researchers to promote research on forgotten crops, including breeding, agronomy, nutrition. Why people should do research only on the few crops for which a lot of people are already investing on the research. We need to invest on these and this will create a kind of sense of pride, I would say, on African researchers to really, okay, we are doing something African, something for Africa. It should enable we, we know, I mean, again, I'm in Nairobi. In Nairobi, there is such a vibrant ICT sector. A lot of innovations are developed there. And why those capacity, the skills, the, the intelligence of these people should not be put to develop new digital methods that can assist farmers to manage complex systems and reduce the drudgery of the work in the farm. It should enable African farmers to develop skills and capacity to manage complex systems. I've been talking over these 20 years with thousands of farmers and they are all happy when you start talking about their own thing because that's their culture. This is what the grandfather, the father, the mothers that we're talking about. They're happy, but then they, they stop using them because there is no support. If you go to the farmers promoting forgotten crops and, and you develop the skills and, and you work with them in understanding the, the culture that is behind and you combine the science with that culture, you can really address uh, you can really find ways to manage those complex systems. It can create quality jobs from seeds to value chain of multiple crops and bio input, circular economy. So instead of having people moving to towns where they cannot find jobs, they can find quality jobs there where the family are, where the roots of, the, of these people are. It can enable African entrepreneurs to invest in processing marketing of forgotten crops through proper incentives. We need the governments, the AFTA, the African Development Bank, to invest on this because this is uh, not about importing machine, but it's about thinking what kind of products can come out of the forgotten for crops. It's another research 
mm. investment on, on the processing, different type of food, different blending, we will hear as well from our entrepreneur here. It can be promoted in, uh, in, in schools, uh, educating children to eat them. And we, we have testimonies that after they start eating them, and then they, they get, for example, in Kenya, the white to gali, they don't want to eat anymore the white to gali because they realize that other types of ugali are much better. And so we need to promote forgotten crops in the African uh, common trade area, ensure the right investment. We've heard a lot even during, uh, during uh, uh, these meetings, this agro-industrial part, etc., cetera, and, and investing in digital. I mean, why those cannot be also considered investing for forgotten crops? And of course, for the research is, is crop improvement. No, I mean, yield of wheat in, uh, in India in 1950 was 700 kilos per hectare, seven quintals. Now it's probably eight, nine, 10 tons per hectare, more than 10 times more. I'm not saying that all the forgotten crops have the same genetic potential, but if start investing and improving those crops, we can really bring them to a point where they can significantly contribute to food security as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. Wally, would you like to give us your, uh, my, my your perspective? Okay. Thank you. Can you, can you please bring, bring up my, my presentation? The third place of Sukati, who would like to be panel, not as a okay. presenter, the panel. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, good evening. It's already good evening, and uh, you're welcome. I, I'm glad that the uh, He's the, that's the head of GIFA. Is that? I'm the executive. Executive director of GIFA. You're welcome. I know we have I'm executive director. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the, the chair. Thank you very much for spending time with us. And, um, I recognize her particularly because uh, uh, she is one of the individuals that are driving the forgotten food at the global level. And thank you for the very good job. Well, I want to talk about um, taking the mainstream of forgotten food in Africa to the next level. And what that title suggests is that we did not start it just today. We've been on this um, shortly before COVID. Is that? <laughs> my, my two um, contemporaries here, they are there at the GIFA and Biovacity International pushing it. So we've started it for, a, for some years now, maybe three, four years, and we've been pushing it on. And I have an understanding that we've done some significant work, but what is the next level? Yeah, I thank you very much for that. I mean, but, but that's for all of us because we are in it together. And I will tell you what we've done in Africa and um, maybe a bit of what other continents are also of doing. I particularly choose it this way because last year we are the CADEP partnership platform. That's a big platform where we report and we summarize the progress of our cultural report, uh, research and development to the African Union Commission. So we organized a side event on forgotten food. And when we, we present, we present, we try, still trying to persuade the policy makers then they come to tell us that, excuse me, they said to me, Wally, I was on the panel, everyone in the world watching. Excuse me, Wally, you have said this many times. Next time you're talking about forgotten food, tell us what's new you have done. So they don't want me to repeat what we've done. And, and I'm sure that my colleague from FAO is listening to this because we're working also with FAO RA, the African, on, on this. And so that is what informed this, so that together we can look at what next to do. We can discuss it adequately in this session and then set it out and possibly we pull together and we do it together. So thank you for your time. So there are a few things we are convinced about already. 
and we don't need to preach again to the converted because people are convinced about that. That forgotten food has immense cultural and consumer significance in Africa. That's a cultural thing. I mean, people within their culture, they know they are indigenous food and they want to eat it. So we don't need to convince them again. We know that it provides nutritious and healthy food options, even better than the six key, key sources of calories. I mean, we like rice and I'm not against rice. I eat it every time. But you know the, how rice tasks the natural resources, especially water, and you know the glycemic index of rice. Can you compare that to phonium that does not take so much water, but it is more nutritious, far more nutritious. Can you compare that to millet and sorghum? No, you can't. So they, it provides more nutritious and healthy food option, and its resilience to the vagaries of climate change and other adversities. I mean, many of these indigenous crops, they are adapted to the natural resource environment. I mean, they can thrive when there is little moisture as well as survive when there is flood. So we know that they can help us um, navigate the trouble of climate change. They are well adapted to the landscape and natural resource domain. And then um, um, everyone is convinced of the need to mainstream forgotten food into Africa food system. Everyone is convinced that, no, we need to bring this on board and it's going to help. We are further fully persuaded that it will smartly complement the big seas food commodities of the world, the rice, the wheat, the, the maize, and, and a few legumes, soya bean, it will, it will complement it. Then it will contribute significantly to food and nutritional security, especially in the marginal spaces of the world. You know, where the, the, the land resources production resources is. Then it will ensure food sovereignty and reduce poverty and food import bill. The issue of food sovereignty is on top. So we are persuaded that it will, it will do this. Then we know that we need to invest in their research and development because that is why they are called forgotten food. Not as if some of these food are not being eaten um, where they are produced. But nobody, they are called often commodity because no, no government, no development partner, no NGO want to invest into their research. They are not part of the big seas. So they look like an orphan commodity. For instance, in cultures like Ghana and Nigeria, they eat yam, the Scoria species. It's a major staple. In fact, the best food in Nigeria, pounded yam, is produced from yam. But nobody wants to invest into its research. I remember many years ago, more than 20 years ago, IFAD came up and invested a bit into it. But that cannot be compared with the volume of money that goes into rice, that goes into maize, and all those stuff. Of course, you know that three institutions, three CGIR centers are existing. Is it three or two? Two CGIR centers are existing for rice, one commodity only, African rice, formerly called WADA, and International Rice Research Institute just for rice. Meanwhile, nobody is interested in, in yam. Nobody is interested in cocoa yam. And these are very nutritious food with potassium, permanganate, with zinc, and many nutrients, yet also full of calories. So that's why they are called forgotten food. And then we know that it will help us balance the hunger equation in the world. Yeah, that hunger equation, it's really very important. So getting strongly into forgotten food. But if it has all this importance and we are convinced about them, you will wonder why are we not giving a lot of effort into, into them? I don't know. You know, I, when we did this research um, around 2020, 2021, during those COVID, and, and we discovered that 46% um, of the forgotten foods in the world have their center of origin in Africa. And, and that, that's this, uh, this, that's what's, so a lot of these forgotten foods, they are in Africa, suggesting that just like Carlos said, there is huge potential for Africa to be food and nutritionally secured in these indigenous, often forgotten foods. And uh, un unless we tap this potential, we will keep struggling around commodities that are introduced into Africa. And we struggle a lot because 
It is not their center of origin. The, we are just struggling to get them adapted. In other words, the capacity to produce them is unlike. We are the originated from, you know? So that's, that is it. Now I want to talk about what we have done and the great people from G5 here about Pacific International, they came up with this idea. I mean, it, and it became very prominent when we began to talk about food system of the United Nations, you know, and, and we, we really pushed it and thanks to GIFA who pushed this down as part of the subject of the United Nations food system transition. And so we developed continental members of the GIFA, we developed the continental manifesto, which we put together into the global manifesto. These documents are published already. They are available in the, uh, yeah, what do you call it? I have some copies. Oh, here. you even have copies here, so you can pick copies of the global manifesto and put them there. The African manifesto, which um, I work with the leaders of Farah and I lead, I, I happen to be the foot soldier. <laughs> I have principles, but I happen to be the foot soldier that worked around the development of the African manifesto. And it went through um, a very critical process, a lot of engagement, discussion and all those stuff, how we came up with this. But, but the points, the 10 points I put here, they are the central thing that find themselves into the global manifesto. The global manifesto actually is talking about what are the issues and then how do we respond to them? So the first thing here is awareness raising. We need to do comprehensive inventory, establish South-South research network, uh, target capacity development, support the conservation of this, then we need to come up with a lot of advocacy. Then we need to mobilize more and better target sustainable investment in research and development, just to mention um, a few of the key components. Now, I, I want to talk about the progress since the year 2020. And I put these six using uh, pictures. The first thing we, we, we've done is to come up with the manifesto of forgotten food. And the African, um, manifest to also have action, a bit of action plan, or do without budget, um, a bit of action plan, we can still work further on the budget component. Then after this, we have series of conversation, webinar, I mean, popularizing this and getting it into the hand. Then we discover that the first step we need to take in Africa is to develop the African community of practice of forgotten food. And we develop this. This community of practice comprises of um, individuals, researchers, private sector, policymakers, technocrats that are already working on forgotten food, but also people that are interested and people that are into. So we have three categories of individuals there. And uh, we have a total of 570 individuals on this community of practice, and they are interacting from time to time, exchanging information. This forms the fulcrum of capacity to advance the issue of forgotten food in, in Africa. Shortly after we launched this uh, Africa community of practice of forgotten food, um, we had a discussion with research community in the United Kingdom. They actually um, stretch the Holy branch to us to come and let's begin to work together. So we link the United Kingdom research, uh, researchers with African researchers to broker partnership for joint research endeavor on different commodities. And then that leverage a bit of um, bilateral funding, but it's, it's on the basis of individual researcher to researcher. So they have freedom to partner. And a few um, funds came up there and a few work um, is done. Bulk of the work, Actually, we last three to five years. So we don't have um, research reports to actually talk about, but we broke out that relationship and it is um, growing. Then um, in the year 2021, FAO, um, the Regional Africa Office, came up with a research program from its nutrition group to look into nutrition um, from the forgotten food. And so we have partnership with Farah, which I led the team to work in developing a compendium of forgotten food in Africa. I'm sure my colleague uh, who will be joining us online, 
uh, Dr. Sukati, uh, who is the um, head of nutrition in FAO Africa. Uh, we talk more about this. We have that. And then, uh, um, number one, we want to do a compendium with critical information on the available forgotten food, not just to do lip service. I mean, this is not the first time we've seen bits and pieces, but we want to put critical one together and we want to do an analysis. Analysis that um, looks into relative details of this, in, in, of this individual commodity and look at their nutritional benefit. Then we did an analysis that actually um, look at the potential of each one to complement the six global commodities. In other words, we're looking at the oil, oil seed, we are looking at calorie sources, I mean, in terms of grains, the calorie sources in terms of root and tubers, um, and then, um, you know, um, protein sources that can mimic soya bean, that can mimic um, others. And we, we did that analysis. And that's number five characterization of forgotten food in Africa. I mean, you know, we've, we've finished our part of this story, but you know that FAO, it's the global organization. It's first class, you know, the scrutiny, the rigor, the first class material still keeps this thing, this document under review. So <laughs> FAO things are never quick. So, so, but it's been done. So it's not available yet. For public consumption because we need to validate every every fact in it so that it will come out but this is coming and it's going to what this document does i have privy to the information in it, is that it tells you where these commodities are the compendium but the green document tells you the potential to serve as replacement where it can be grown what nutrients it contains and a bit of agronomic analysis around it it's a very rich resource that is going to help us to make decisions and then, you know, the sixth one is series of webinars, consultations, uh, conferences that we have uh, organized. So that is the progress since 2020. I want to use this, my last slide, to say what are the next big things that we need to do? Because all these we've done, they still look to me like preparatory work. And I don't want the FAO boss to say, well, they have asked you not to talk about things we know, tell me new things you've done, especially on the field. So I call it field activities. And, and I went back into African manifesto and the um, line of actions. What are the things that we need to do in Africa to mainstream so that Africans that are here, by the time they eat their menu for one week, they have eaten at least five to 10 forgotten things. And, and that, that looks like a, a crude project for me. And the first thing I saw in, in our um, manifesto is, we need to increase communication and awareness and do awareness creation with the civil society. I mean, that goes beyond just training. But, but I mean, social media push, you, you know, um, um, radio jingles and a lot of all these other things talking about it in school, finding champions among prominent policymakers, finding champions even among celebrities, footballers, you, you know, artists and musicians, so that it becomes a song in the mouth of the civil society. Why, when we're developing the compendium, why people thought that this is important is because the six commodities were already labeled as egalitarian people food. And the forgotten food that are richer than those who they have been termed poor people's food. And so for the young generation, 40 years and below, when you talk about those forgotten, they don't want to see it. Don't, don't, don't make me a poor man. This food is meant for the poor. Meanwhile, it is the opposite. So we need to, to reconscientize our culture. And that's why I think number one is the next level of action that we need to take. And, and we should do this with matrix. The second one is we need to commission research and development activity to scale existing proven technologies around new food products. What am I talking about? Some of this food, we really need to do a bit more of research to package them. Some of this food, they are also known to have anti nutritional factor. And it is exactly the same for the six commodities that are promoted across the globe. If you know the volume of anti nutritional factor in soya, Maybe you will be afraid about consuming it. 
but it has to go through certain processes. You get it for the antinutritional factor to be broken and it is ready for eating the same way some of these vegetables and, and so on and so forth. So that research is necessary. Number three, we need to facilitate engagement with the private sector and uh, we need to incentivize investment in the promotion of this new commodity. I mean, in Africa, we try so much to reduce the debt burden from wheat. Nigeria spent 4 billion US dollars on wheat importation annually. I mean, that, that, that goes far um, into like 30 or 40% of our GDP. Suggesting we use 30% of our GDP to import only one commodity. You, you get it, no, it's, it's not sustainable. And so in our bread, I mean, the CG Center ITA conducted the research and we supplemented um, the wheat flour with up to 30% cassava flour. Cassava is a forgotten food commodity. Of course, Seat worked on it for many years. ITA still continue to work on it, but it's still at local level and it's a major source of calories for us. So we supplemented. I learned now sweet potato is also supplementing wheat in, in, and a lot of work is going on. Now, this type of um, thing, we need, to put, we need to incentivize it as it were, bring it to industrial level, promote it and let it go. Then we need to lobby the donors and development partners' interest and African policymakers for investment in the development of forgotten food. This is what I mean. Not as if we are going to depend on donors forever, but if we lobby donors, we want them to support what we have started so that easily we can get there. I think the next level of action in Africa is for us to be ashamed. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. You get it? We cannot expand our kitchen, our, the number of children in our family based on the size of the kitchen of our neighbors. Hmm? So possibly what I mean here is African-based funders, Okay, African governments lobby them at least to invest something into it. Then we can go to the development partners to say support what we're doing and we can move forward. Um, on this note, I want to thank you for listening to me. And I believe that during the panel, we have opportunity to interrogate this subject further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wally. Uh, I think we'll call upon. Uh... FAO and uh, Dr. Sukati, if I understand, is online. Yeah, online. Hello. 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 Can someone hear me? Hello. Oh, okay. You can hear. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe uh, I'll. Uh, kindly allow me to share my screen because uh, if I can kindly be allowed to share my screen, please. Oh, okay. That's Sukati. <clears throat> Thank you. It will be good to see your face also. Yes, it, it will come with the screen. <laughs> If I can kindly share my screen. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Now I think I can. But we are not seeing it. Our height is working on it, but you are fine where you are. Uh, okay. Let's our just is, make it very possible for us. Is it coming? Oh, yes, we've seen it, it now. It has come. Put, oh, okay. Put it in Maybe. full screen mode. All right, let me try that. Thank you. I think it's 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 in order now, kindly. First class, first class, brother. Okay, Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, let me try to open the video. Yes. You cannot start your video. Oh, because... now we've seen, we've seen your small picture. Thank you, brother. But I cannot start the video. They say you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Let me try again. Yeah. 
Uh, don't, don't worry. It's okay. Okay. It's Let me not okay. worry about that. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, my colleagues. Good morning. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon everywhere. I'm I'm currently in Toko, where where I am making this presentation from. Uh, and I would kindly like to introduce myself to you. My name is a uh, Mpumuzi Sukati, but everyone calls me Muzi. I'm a senior food and nutrition officer at, uh, at FAO. I'm here in Togo as acting FAO representative here on mission. So I, I think, well, I would like to really commend the, 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 the presenters that came before me. Uh, I, I think probably they make my work difficult or they make my work easy. I, I, I don't know, because a lot of the things that I'm going to say, they've said it and probably they've said, they, they've said it better than I'm going to say it. But pro, I believe my presentation will also add, uh, add insights in, in what they have already said. And thank you for that. Well, I think we, we uh, as Africans here yeah, in Africa, we, we really know the, the, the challenges that we are faced with, but zeroing in on the nutrition, we know the, the problems that we are facing now. While we are battling with the problems of uh, undernutrition, which, which have got a lot of drivers driving it, including the climate change and extreme weather conditions, which also feeds into the stunting and wasting micronutrient deficiencies, especially vitamin A, iron, and iodine. We know how important these micronutrients are, especially for, for our, young, uh, our, <clears throat> our, our young girls who are growing up and who are going to be mothers, and, uh, and also the, uh, for, 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 women, uh, for women and children. It's very important. But while we are battling with that, we are also seeing a, an alarming rise in overweight and obesity, which fit into the non-communicable diseases. We know that our health systems are not go going to cope up with the, with these uh, with, with these uh, emerging issues, which can be prevented by by our diets and how we eat. And of course, we also have all these problems that are related uh, to, to our nutrition. We, we, we do not have to forget these, uh, the, these problems that have impact on nutrition, you know, because I think right now the COVID is gone and people are starting to forget about it. But I think all these things are, are, are still there in the background. And I think they are going to come back in many forms. And we still have issues of uh, HIV, uh, uh, TB, malaria. And I, 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 I really, have to call the, to 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 say that we don't have to forget COVID because I think it's still lacking so, somewhere there and probably another uh, pandemic similar to it is going to come and we know it's it's going to come. So the prevalence of undernourishment it, it shows that we are off track to meeting the sustainable development goal number two, including our own Malabo targets of up to uh, of 2025 for two years away. We, we've been off track, the numbers are not convincing. We still have uh, up to 200 and 278 million people or more who are still undernourished and the numbers is, uh, are increasing. And we, we, we also have to know that there, there are hunger hotspots, you know, so it's not only, it's not, not all the hunger statistics are uniform, but there are hunger <clears throat> hotspots, some regions are affected more than others. I think this is important in our interventions. So using the, the food insecurity experience scale, which is one of the SDG2 indicators that is tracked by, uh, the, by, by FAO and the UN in, in general, we see, we, 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 we see that uh, a lot of people are still in, in, in severe food insecurity in the hotspots, in the hotspots only, whereby we are seeing a, 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 some, some critical numbers in the hotspots disaggregated by, by gender. So in the hotspots, we, we, we still have a lot, a, lot, a lot of issues there, but I think the critical thing is that uh, we have to know that it, it affects uh, women and men differently, which, which has got critical uh, gender in inclusivity implications. So one of, one of the critical things that, uh, that has come up in recent years is the cost of healthy diets. It's, it's, it's becoming very expensive. The estimates are saying that up to 1 billion people in Africa cannot afford healthy diets. It's too expensive. Then they, they then resort to the energy dense foods, which are driving all sorts of other uh, malnutrition problems. And then uh, here, I would like to also mention that uh, 
the indigenous food. I, I, I don't know like whether the indigenous food is the right name, but I, I, I would prefer to use the forgotten foods. In, in one of the seminars, someone said that they are opportunity foods. So the more you promote them, the more you promote them is that it, they increase co consumer demand. And sometimes yeah. with the consumer demands, the price just shoot up. At the end of the day, it becomes too expensive again for the people who, who, who really need it, you know, because you've advocated for so much for, for it. Consumers start to believe, consumers start to believe in it, and the rich guys start come now and start using it, and then the price just shoots up, you know. So, but then the forgotten foods, we know the role they, they, that they, 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 they stand to play. You know, research has shown that they, they play a critical role in a, in, in resilient food, uh, resi resilience, they are climate smart, they, 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 they thrive where other crops cannot, they, they cannot thrive. So I think they, 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 are, they are good with the, with, with the issues that we are faced. I was, I, I was happy that uh, we were recently in, in, in an event uh, at, uh, at headquarters where African Union was there as well, whereby we were looking at these uh, interactions between these traditional crops and the climate. And so much, so much is going on to, to, to increase their uh, research into it. And I'm very happy with the collaboration we are having with FARA on this. And we will be looking up to FARA to help us to beef up the research. And we know these. Uh, declarations that, uh, that, that are helping us drive all these uh, issues together. The, our ICN decade of action, the SDGs, our own Malabo, and of course the other, other, other initiatives like Ending Hunger in the initiatives and the African Leaders for Nutrition by the African Development Bank, where we are hoping we can get some, some funding for it. So there are a lot of these tri types of uh, traditional foods. Uh, they are all over the place. I think if you are in Africa and you know them by instinct, you know, but some, sometimes people who come from outside, but probably everyone, because I think they are there in all the other regions. We know some of us who grew up here in Africa, we've been eating these foods, we know, but we know, we, we can see and we know that our, our, our children and the youth, they don't know about them, they've disappeared from our tables and it's, it's a fact and it's true. So in the context of the SDGs, they have a very big role to play, definitely. And of course, in the, also in, the, in our FAO strategic framework, which is based on better production, better nutrition, better environments and better lives, leaving no one behind. They sit in all the better here. And I really like the, the, the opening remarks that were made that we should not forget the people's faces behind the, the, these foods, you know, we, we, the, the people who stands to benefit from the, the, the people in the rural areas. I don't know whether we can call them indigenous, uh, but we, we, we know what we mean really. So, FAO is doing a lot of work with this, we, we, with part, partners, for example, in 2015, they, there was a big seminar on, on promoting the, the, these kinds of food. And, uh, and also in 2018, it happened again, and it came up with a lot of recommendations. And some of the, or, or, of the recommendations are, are, are there in that link that, that I can share. I will definitely share the presentation with you after the, the, after the, the event. Then, uh, well, we've done a lot of consultative meeting, and we, we really treasure the, 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 the partnerships we have with African Union, NEPAD. I think it's out of NEPAD now. And of course, I highlighted FARA there because really we, 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 it, it is with FARA that we have, we, we have really seen this moving because we have developed a compendium with FARA, like uh, uh, Professor Wally has said, is still going through some rigorous checks, but it is, it is looking good and it, it will come up out very soon because we are really following up with our technical experts to make sure that it is bulletproof and we are not feeding people the wrong information. And then we've had a lot of dialogues under the issues of uh, addressing overweight obesity using the uh, traditional ways. And we are uh, still looking at ways of how these uh, traditional foods can find their way into food-based dietary guidelines, which are guidelines of how the nation should eat. Each nation has got their own food-based 
dietary guidelines, but not only on food-based dietary guidelines, but also in other feeding programs, school feed feeding programs, for example, I think they, they can be great in making sure that probably our children take them up, develop their taste for them, and, they, and of course, also pass the baton to their children as well. We know the problems we are having with app and food systems, and they have a big role to play. It needs consistency, coordination, and building the, the, the evidence, and probably developing short value chains and local sourcing. I think the, the, the Ukraine uh, Russia war, there is no need for Africa to be uh, to be scratching their heads because of, of wars that are not even in the continent. When we can promote our own systems and, uh, and promote local sourcing and short value chains. So wh what are the key issues uh, that, 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 I mean, the key takeaways that we can think of? Uh, traditional foods are not a poor man's food. I think this is, this is number one that, that we need to drive that. It's not a poor, poor man's food. It, 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 it is food that is, can be consumed by anybody. And it, it is better than the fast foods that we, we, we think they are, they are in style. And then the governments, they really should take a lead into promoting these, uh, these foods. I am happy that, for example, at FAO, we have really advocated that the, the traditional foods form part of our African regional conference this year, so that we hear from the government themselves, from, themselves on how they see the investments in research and their development coming up. You know? So they are part of diversifying the food baskets, and of course, the, 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 edu, the consumer education and the advocacy and most, most, most very important is well bringing in the private sector because the, I mean, governments can invest in this, in the research, but then it's the private sector who's going to drive the change. And then just to for, uh, not to forget COVID and its impact on, on, on nutrition, I just brought <clears> this slide and, and saying that we, we shouldn't be happy that COVID is gone. We, we should still be thinking about these pandemics that are going to come, which have an impact on nutrition. And just to say that the forgotten foods have, have got a very big role to play in the whole food, food, uh, food value chain from the food supply, the environment, the consumer behavior, they must be linked into, into all these food systems approach for better nutrition outcomes. So these are just uh, some of the, the, this is just the FAO strategy for nutrition and just to assure participants that uh, the traditional food systems are well covered in this strategy and FAO is ready to work with partners to, to, to promote them, including FARA and other partners, research, research centers, and uh, et cetera. I thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for your intervention, Dr. Sukati. And I'll now call the panelists to come and join me. And uh, we will start uh, a discussion on uh, maybe on some more challenging uh, aspects uh, because we need now to think ahead on how to move and how to move fast. So maybe Wally, you know, I, I call I call them, uh, but so we have uh, Evelyn Ocott, Caroline Alango, Dominique Pucci, I hope I pronounce it well, and Nalishebo Mebelo. Can come, up, come over here. Dominic Pucci is joining us online. Please come on. Please. Right. <sighs> Microphones. You know, can we can you respond so that we hear your voice? Yes, I'm online. Thank you. So sorry, who who's online? Dominic. So thank you very much. Before uh, uh, moving to our to our debate, uh, and I'll ask you very please to introduce yourself and maybe say a few words about what you do. I'd uh, like just to try a transition from what we heard to what we're going to do now. And as we, as you were presenting um, the three uh, three the three speakers, 
I, it, it really came to my mind uh, that we are maybe at stage one of what we could call, and you maybe allow me the term, a scientific revolution. Uh, in the sense, I mean, that's why I really, I mean, that's at least my feeling. You know, it took a lot of time to accept that the earth is revolving around the sun. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of time. And before we thought, they thought that the sun was revolving around the earth. If you go and look at that transition, I mean, how much time it took and what were the steps? And this has been studied by a person called Thomas Kuhn, who wrote a great book on the structure of scientific revolution. Uh, the first step was gathering evidence. So when the evidence became overwhelming, when the observation <laughs> became overwhelming, and you could not deny anymore the truth, which is that Earth is revolving around the sun, yeah. then you know the paradigm changed. Now, sorry for this sort of uh, intellectual flight, but I think from what we heard, we are now saying that there is a substantial body of evidence uh, that you know forgotten foods are essential, are important. I mean, we heard the potential. We heard uh, what Wally called uh, we are committed, but you gave also a lot of elements. We heard the beginning of action. We heard from FAO also all the references to hunger, undernourishment, and many, many points that we find in the manifesto. But this is all paper. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can consider that stage one has been achieved. We have the evidence. We don't need to justify anymore. I mean, I don't think the need for uh, looking at forgotten foods, but we are still in the world in which we think that the sun is revolving around the earth. And I'll talk about the world of the green revolution. I talk about the world of uh, um, trying to transfer improved varieties uh, from one place to another. I talk about the world of modernization, et cetera. So what could we do? And it's how I would like to introduce the panel. Um, in order to accelerate this transition to another world. And I brought here you know, an example because this is poor people food. Now it's nicely packaged, but it's really poor people food if you look at it. But if I show you this, this is not anymore poor people food. Yeah. This is very attractive. It actually comes from a company and we had lunch together with a gentleman owning this company based in Ghana. There are fornio plates. I mean, look at the packaging. I want this on my table for my children in Europe. So I suppose also in Africa. So there's something that is changing, but it's you know very limited. It's marginal. If you hear the story of this gentleman, it's really a difficult story. And it's through his energy that this was made. So now we have other examples. So the point is, how can we accelerate all this. And so I'll turn now to our first uh, panelist, uh, Evelyn. And uh, I'd like, well, first to ask you if you can yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Sure. And then I have basically uh, two questions for you. And uh, one would be, uh, you, ha you have found that this activity is profitable, that what you've done has you know, a, a perspective of profit. And how would you um, define the incentives for other producers to come along and do what you've done? What, what is, according to you, missing in the incentives that have to be, that have to be generated in order to encourage many more people to do what you're going to tell us you have done? Please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I will start with my name. My name is Evelyn Okroth. I'm from Kenya. I'm a Kenyan. Um, I work with an a CBO. In our CBO, we are uh, women. It is a, a a women thing. A women owned. Um, we do. We conserve the forgotten food seeds we deal with seeds so we conserve the seeds is it okay 
Huh? Right. So uh, in uh, we consult them in a, a facility called a Seed Bank. So we are seed bankers. So I am here to represent uh, farmers from Kenya, the seed bankers, the seed conservers. So um, in our seed bank, we conserve the forgotten. We 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 do we do to call them. We used to call them the moose. Uh, and uh, now we call them the forgotten foods. There are so many names. Um, so we conserve cassava, sorghum. We have different types of sorghum, like 10 in our seed bank. We also do um, beans, where we have around 67 different varieties of beans. Uh, we also have um, the finger millet. Uh, there we have five varieties, different varieties. Uh, we also do the African leafy vegetables. Yeah, where we have uh, 15 different varieties of um, um, the African leafy vegetables. We are also doing sesame. Uh, we also have the sweet potato vines. Uh, we are also conserving um, groundnuts. Uh, in grounds, we have uh, uh, the four, four varieties, the red Valencia, the Homer Bayer, the black one. Um, we are also doing uh, what else? Um, I've, say, I've talked of the sweet potato vines and I've talked of the cassava. Um, in our seed bank, we are also doing, we are not only conserving, but we are also offering uh, trainings to to the local farmers that you are working with. Uh, the, the, the trainings that you are offering, we are um, telling them on the spacing, how they can do the right spacing, uh, the, the, the right time of planting, you know, uh, the preparation of the land, the good variety that can do well in their um, farms. Uh, we are also doing seed, con uh, seed selection after harvesting, we are doing seed selection. Um, we are also uh, mobilizing and sensitizing the community on the benefits of uh, the forgotten foods. Because um, nowadays, it's like people are they are for forgetting uh, our local foods. They are going on the other foods that are ready to, to get, but they are leaving the important foods that are, you know, these forgotten foods, uh, some are medicinal. Yeah. And uh, there are also nutrition. Um, I want to use a, a, an example. If you compare uh, a baby or a child being raised in an urban area with a, a child that is being raised in an, a rural area, if you tell them or if you find them that they, are, they, they were fighting, automatically you will see the one raised in the rural area will beat the one in the urban area. These forgotten foods are, they have energy and they also, they are bodybuilding. So we are living behind. And also don't forget that, I don't know, the scientists may help me, but there is something they do in the brain. So you will find that they are very sharp. So I've realized it. So uh, we, 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 we started this uh, by an organization called uh, uh, Biodiversity, uh, the Alliance of Biodiversity Strokes yet. And um, they, we got help from them. They helped us with uh, the facility and we started conserving the seeds in that um, facility. And uh, as I'm speaking now, the community is getting, they have access to seeds, good seeds. Now, the problem is here. Um, I was asked on the big change, the big mind, I think. I had uh, three questions, but you said there are two. So you just deal with the two. I deal with the three, thank you. So, there, there are some things that we have to look before even, you know, I'm a farmer and I want you to hear it from me. There are some things that we have to do first if you want to achieve something. First of all, we have to look on the farmer. 
because this is the person who wants to produce this thing is when the producer will take it or maybe uh, any sector in that value chain. And the farmer also will have to look on the farm where she or he wants to produce other product. So when the farm is not good, when it is not, it, it doesn't have fertility, I'm telling you, there will be no product. And we know, we all know about the climate change that has uh, affected uh, the land. So we have the degraded land. So there is a need of some technologies that, uh, the, I, I mean, the, um, um, what do you call them? The um, agroecology technologies that can be used so that we can raise, we can um, again, Raise the, raise the fertility of the land so that it can produce a good product. You know, when the soil is good, then it will produce a healthy food. So these um, technologies of agroecology are so many. We have um, the vermiculture technology, we have the hydroponic technology, we also have um, termite trapping, there's so many. We have the mulching, the intercrop, the crop rotation, the agroforestry. But we, the farmers cannot do all these things because of labor intensive. So one, a farmer needs support on how these things can be done. They are running out of this just because there are no um, mechanisms that can be used for them to make this thing easier. Again, there is need of what we call, um, okay, I will just call it finance, but it's seed money. As a seed banker, we should have seed money for multiplication. Because at times, what happens mostly, we normally plant late just because we lack these mechanisms, the equipment that can help us to do this thing at the right time. So farmers need these things so that they can prepare the lands earlier, they plow it earlier, they leave it to rest, they replow it again, then they plant. When the rain starts, they plant. So when it will be um, too much rain, it will get, uh, the plants, if they have uh, grown, so it will not affect them. But if we are planting late, let's get me. Oh, yeah. If we are planting late, we will not harvest because it will be destroyed by floods. Uh -huh. Another thing, um, I think there is a, also, I've talked of two. Yeah, there is also a need of, um, the machineries, I've talked to them. I think, um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have 25 minutes to close. Yeah, uh, Caroline. Yeah. So would you like to tell us a bit about your organization, yourself, uh, and uh, maybe tackle the issue of, uh, is that, you know, issue of profitability of the, of the forgotten food business, uh, and again, this issue of the incentives that are needed uh, to uh, support mainstream forgotten food. Um, thank you very much. Um, I came with some products, but I'm an entrepreneur, so they were all bought off. So I've actually asked them to do for me a picture of what I do. So that is me, and that's what I do. My company is called Dash Crop Limited. The brand of products that I do are called Dash Foods. Um, this is a company that was started in the year. 2015, uh, basically to solve the problem of off-taking of what we call the climate resilient, high nutrition forgotten foods. They have a lot of names and I think they're the most baptized foods if that is the case. Um, Dutch Cop Limited is a female owned and female managed. And we realized that there was a gap in both ends. From the farmer, and by design, if you look at the kind of crops which are categorized as forgotten, they were not seen to be so commercially viable. 
So what happened because of the engendered nature of our society, they are actually what I would call also female crops. So as a result, 60% of the farmers that I work with, I've worked with over 12,000 farmers in what I call the Western Region Economic Block in Kenya are female because of the kind of crops that I chose. That is crops like amaranth, finger millet, cassava, basically roots and tubers, vegetables, and I also um, was doing grains. So that is uh, what I did. And I realized that there was again a gap on the family side. We've seen the fact, I don't want to go back to the statistics on malnutrition, but you know very well that over 60% of uh, children in Africa face malnutrition. And why was they having malnutrition? Because what would happen is that uh, what were they producing? Most people are just producing maize. <laughs> you can't eat maize and maize alone and do anything. So what I did was to come up with products that uh, would be able to provide both food security and nutrition from all the customer segments uh, in our country. And I categorized them into four. I'll be very fast because of time. I categorized the first category was actually what I call the base of the pyramid customer. Those who earn very little money, less than maybe a dollar or maybe a dollar to $2 a day. And uh, the second category I realized were having issues were institutions. These are schools, hospitals. They also needed to provide proper nutrition. It's very funny that in Kenya and some countries in Africa, then food given to patients <laughs> does not help them in healing at all. And you know, if it's not food, then it's probably it's poison. And then lastly, the third category of the customers that I realized were those people who can afford to have food, but they want healthy food, but they want it in a manner that is uh, like what you are shown, packaged well enough. And so that is what I do in my company, basically tucking, turning this forgotten food into something that is palatable. I'm now doing 123 supermarkets, over 513 retail stores, over 20 institutions. And I believe I will be able to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we turn now to uh, a perspective from a young person, uh, Dominique, who's online? And we go back you know, to this issue of the poor, poor people crops. So how can poor people crops attract young people? And you know, also crops that are considered uh, primitive, you know, so to speak, or in any case, uh, uh, lost in the past, forgotten. So how can we move towards a vision of crops for the future to use the definition of a, of a research center? So please, uh, Dominique, can you tell us a word about you and give us your view? Hello? Dominique. Yes, Dominique. Yes, we can hear you. you put on your camera if you want us to see you. And that's if your internet is good. Otherwise, go ahead. Yes, it's, it's muted. The camera is muted. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity. I'm Dominique Uchi from Nigeria, a PhD student and also a member of Young Professional for Agricultural Development, a working group on policy document uh, right now. Uh, uh, this topic is so important to use a uh, perspective uh, for the future of the youth and because as the, uh, the earlier speaker, speakers have said, and the, the youths, are uh, really very important in order to connect uh, for this uh, food, uh, forgotten uh, food, in order to, to link it uh, to the rural areas and, the, and so that the end users uh, will make uh, judicial use, use of it. As we can see, uh, youths are very innovative risk takers and they form the major force, that is the labor force, especially in Africa. But they have been neglected. There is no uh, empowerment and for youth. And moreover, when they produce, there have been no market actors, there have been no uh, market lead. In order to make an enabling environment for forgotten food and within youth and opportunities, there should be a value a chain 
in each phase of the of the of the production in each phase of the production in each phase of the production that is a uh, production uh, processing and marketing and the, and the, and then and the creating market access uh, within uh, this product it will also bring uh, about employment in, in this sector of uh, forgotten of forgotten food it is very important that youth that are at the level first uh, have not uh, their voice have not been heard they have challenges of lack of uh, access to land and they also policies that are not uh, favorable favorable to them so there is every need, need to increase to create a favorable environment for youth participation and also link link this uh, forgotten food if the youth have participated in the production there should be market access for them in creating this there should be ict internet internet of things and artificial technology within and also networking within the youth in order to uh, explore every opportunity to showcase that the forgotten food food have a uh, potential to create employment uh, within the youth within the youth sector as well this forgotten food if youths can make the the opportunity very well i'm referring to you because i'm youth advocate Casey, I, I, i'm speaking for the youth because in any program that comes up youth are being forgotten their rules and their roles are not included the the policies are not uh, favorable uh, favorable for them and these are also climate uh, resilience uh, uh, and uh, smart and approach uh, and uh, techniques of using uh, forgotten food. As you can see, most of these forgotten food are legumes. And these uh, legumes are the ones that, for example, when you plant it, it also tends to it reduce the amount of greenhouse gas, that is the nitrogen, by attracting it to itself okay. for the fertilizer. Dominic, you've made up your you've made your Hello. point. You've made your point. Time is not so much on our side. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank Thanks. you very Thanks much. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, Caroline wanted just to add some challenges. Yes. And I would wish to address Mr. Wally, give us the impetus to talk, please, kindly. Because it is forgotten foods. We see most of be forgotten in terms of time. Because when you are speaking and someone interrupts, what happens? You'll actually use looks track of what you're doing. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you so much. We will be fast, but allow us, please, without interruption, to make our point. May I not be like the forgotten foods. Uh, so um, I'll be straightforward to one thing. You realize what happens as Africans. Let me give me that, that challenge. Let us also give some leverage in terms of our governments, in terms of our policies towards these forgotten foods. I come from Kenya. We are hiring land in Zambia to do maize. I mean, Malawi doesn't make a lot of sense. A lot of money. I'm so happy that somebody talked from FAO. I wished one day that I could get an opportunity to do a three minute pitch and talk to these people. Where are we putting our money? I'm an entrepreneur. When I go to the bank to give me a loan, within three, 30 days, they want their money back. Is it enough time for me to have launched a product, to have marketed it? to have done everything so that that project can be known. So basically for me, I'll go straight to what I think are the challenges and the solutions very fast within 60 seconds. I promise that. Number one, avail us the research and the innovation we talk about, not in the boardroom, but let it be outside there where the consumers can hear about this. Help us to make this food, to market this food, the same way that there are adverts for is everything support us as entrepreneurs to be able to access funding because sometimes she talked about seed money we need that seed money to be able to start off i'm a woman i'm running an sme i hear there is money for SMEs. i asked i was asking carlo where is this money yes we have been overtrained. we no longer want to do webinars we want to be empowered to do the real thing thank you very much Please, when you live here today, try an African food. It will work. I don't want to talk about much because you guys gave the solutions. Everything is here. And I believe together we can do it to make Africa great again. When you come to Nairobi, go to any Shandarana branch, you'll get my product. May God bless you.
Uh, Walia, how much time do we have left exactly? Because we're driven through audience, we still have 25 minutes. We have 25 minutes. Okay. So I would like, before going to conclusions and a, a three challenging questions to some of the presenters, to open the floor. So for, we need some reactions, please. So I'll go just in the order of the row, if you don't mind. So first, go ahead. I'll just move uh, according to the rows. Go ahead. You come here. Can you come here and then you can use that. Okay. okay. Mine is just a quick comment to Professor Fatumbi's presentation. I because some somebody also has presented that one forgotten foods are not for, actually forgotten foods. They're opportunity crops, and I think one of the things we can do even from this meeting is to start referring to them as opportunity crops. Two, we need to also to see how we can integrate the promotion of this into current trends. So rather than investigating for the anti-nutritional, begin to investigate for their resilience, begin to investigate for their nutritional factors, which these crops certainly have. Otherwise, so there on, these are things that will help us drive this. Good job all the same, but I think we can work harder on that. Yeah. First, first of all, I would like to really thank her because it's what I have been talking, saying in my country that the women needed city support to start their life for the farmers, for everything. Very good. So second, uh, my observation in, in terms of uh, when you call it forgotten food, I think it's not forgotten. It's maybe it's neglected food because the people, they, 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 don't, they don't know uh, what which are the food of uh, with the nutrition component so we need to educate people to know what they are producing what kind of nutrition maybe it's not the right food for getting it's neglected i have it do it to like okay thank you very much uh, thank you very much i'll just take the opportunity to thank everybody here i'm just looking at the forgotten food at first we're looking at when there's a problem Rural women, women go to the forest to pick all these foods and bring it home for us to eat. We are now cutting the trees, we are cutting whatever. So most of them are not even lost. And the few that you people pick and bring it, we have to see how researchers can nurse these seeds for us to grow them. Because some of them are even vanished yes. from the this thing. So the researchers have to see how we can nurse it and then we plant them and have it. When we get it, it was even said, when you plant it and you harvest, when you harvest it to the market, they buy it even at a higher cost because it's not there. So let's find a way of multiplying it. Thank you. You, you see the way two of us stand so that you can expect <laughs> that. Okay. I can make only three points. The first one, uh, very quick, the first one, and I've made my voice always very clear. As an African, I feel bad to be hearing that these foods are forgotten. I've always put it, I was in the webinars for UN, I said, these are indigenous foods neglected by donors for development. So we want to use indigenous. Oh. Please give them the right name so that we work together. Secondly, and I'm a scientist, but in Africa. Thank you. The second one is, uh, I like the mapping you have done there. Please remember to do some participatory work to know why we've been eating these foods. Because I am seeing like we are starting from the drawing board. I took many slides, which were uh, photos of those slides. Please remember, get our voice, get the voice of the people. Why have we been eating these foods? I want to tell you, like East Africa, we've gone through droughts. Carlo, thank you for recognizing the droughts. Did you know that some of these uh, so-called, uh, I want to use indigenous, are the ones which they are using either for digging the roots to eat with whatever uh, starch they are provided for food, 
they are those which survive the harsh climate drought. And I want them, I don't believe they are 121 species. I saw that. So there's more work to be done, uh, Farah. It's not 121 species, yeah. the whole continent. Mm -hmm. We have more than that. Because you have to consider our vegetables, you have to consider our fruits. Yeah? You, uh, there are too many 121 species, I don't agree. Thank you so much. <laughs> That, that's all right. Okay, we, sir. We, we respond to that. Okay. okay. Yes. Quick. Uh, is in place. So don't worry. Number one, I have two interventions. Number one, don't let us make the mistake we made with the conventional crops with this. Because in most instances, they produce and they pray for buyers to come. We should know all the gains that we had in the terms of value chain, value addition and all of that, we should take them in situ. Another thing I want to say is that because I work for extension scaling, uh, even climate smart practices that are indigenous, that are closer to the people, you don't need to spend much money to promote them because people already know. All we need to do is just to beam attention on it and let them. So in support, we call it indigenous and maybe underutilized, but they are not forgotten. Thank you. <laughs> indigenous and underutilized, not forgotten. Thank you. I think uh, in this case, I want, uh, I want to say that let us get all the actors, the value chain actors in this. I did my PhD in 1999 on finger millets. Finger millet. Finger millet. We evaluated those varieties. Hmm. In fact, we identified varieties that were preferred by men and preferred by women. Okay. Vegetables also, over several years ago, when we started with only women okay. and small crops, so when they became lucrative, so the talk. men got into it. Okay. And so with vegetables now, no. I want to say the status now, right now in Kenya, as I know, as a sure. researcher, it's just that we need to come together. As a researcher right now, I want to say beans, sorghum, finger millet, ALVs, cassava are highly profitable and many people are getting into them. And we've done a lot of research in these areas. We just need to come together as stakeholders because I think it is the silo problem we still have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The last question. Hello, everybody. Um, firstly, I like to have a round of applause for the farmer lady here because she was the one who's knowledgeable, active, as well as proactive. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes, of course, she is a woman. And so um, secondly, I would like to say that we are dealing with something which is um, under our purview, halfly, but under not our purview. For example, when uh, strategy wins, that is the force in which it is carried through. So uh, when we are discussing this kind of uh, debatable you know, uh, terminologies, of course, I leave it on GVAR and others to guide us and CGR to help us out. But then we are talking about uh, taking the market forces head on. So um, really we have to think how we can put a bottom up approach like the farmers going up or a top down, the policies do it. In between is the market, we have to see those things. So it's a triangle kind of thing. That's why it's so much difficult for you. For example, Dash Foods, I congratulate you too, that you being, I mean, bringing that porridge. I saw it on your stall also. We were stalled on the, yesterday at the taxi also, and I, it's appreciable that product. Uh, how the market forces, for example, Dash Foods, how is Kellogg going to see to it? See to it if at all it rises to the Pan-Africa level. So those things need to be studied first because these are also policy things as well as market dynamic things. And it's a uh, homework for us, uh, um, I mean, Alessandro, maybe. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. A, a round of applause for everybody. Yeah, thanks. So we try to move towards the conclusion, but I, I'd just like to briefly uh, point to a few, few issues before making a final round of questions to our initial presenters. And I hope they will be challenging enough to make them uncomfortable. 
that's a, that's the the scope. I mean, the, the purpose. But at first, on the on the notion of forgotten foods, I mean, I think you know when a word is provoking, it's a good sign. So if you are provoked, it's a good sign. But uh, I would like also to mention that we have here the CEO of Crops for the Future. Yes. So an international center was created on the notion of crop oh. for the future. Oh. It was not created on forgotten foods. Can... So we do have, uh, I don't know if Sayed, you want to say something, on the notion of crops for the future, because I think it's a huge debate. Mm. And probably when your center was created, there was you know, a reason why you chose this uh, name. I didn't choose the title, but I think it's a great one because it says crops for the future, which means the future climate, the future social conditions, the future crises and i just wondered while we were in this discussion in this conference the president of the A african development bank has been here in response to the war in ukraine african development bank has committed 1.4 billion dollars to replace the wheat rice maize imported from ukraine by growing wheat rice maize in africa imagine if that 1.4 billion was going to go to african crops to respond to that crisis. And a, an hour ago, I was at a meeting where they announced 5,000 scholarships between Portugal, uh, sorry, between Africa and Brazil. And not one of those is identified for agrobiodiversity. They're all identified commodity crops. Now that's an opportunity missed because Brazil is a global center of biodiversity. Africa is the other one. So imagine the powerhouse Africa and Brazil would be if that collaboration of 5,000 PhD students was actually committing at least some of those to agrobiodiversity and, 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 and forgotten crops. Thanks, uh, thanks yeah. a lot. Sayed. Thank you. Uh, a sec I think a second very important point, I mean, among many that was made, but I really am particularly keen about this one, especially having our goods next to Unilever, uh, we have really to understand that when we will move to this, and we will move to this, farmers well, might lose completely control for the simple reason that is ex this is extremely attractive, extremely profitable compared to the, to the seeds that are in the basket. So we need to make sure that farmers remain at the center of the whole dynamic. How? This we don't know. And I just would like to tell you, we are fielding together with biodiversity, uh, with FARA, with Foragro, with APARI, with the regional fora, but also with farmer organizations, a major project that we hope DC will finance, precisely to give an answer to those questions, among others. But one of the key questions is when you enter into a market that is under a particular regime, which we can call liberalist, capitalist, whatever, and you're not uh, a major enterprise, how can you avoid uh, that all the benefits, once you have developed uh, value added, get ripped off by the usual suspects? So that we don't have an answer, but we will look for the answer into this, re this, this research program, among other things. And it's more maybe related to the other question that I will, that I will ask. So I'd like to turn to, um, to just three questions in which I'll try to challenge as much as possible, since they are tired, they might also give us the truth. Uh, <laughs> I will challenge here, my friend. I'll start with FAO. And if uh, Dr. Sukati is still online. Sukati, it... are you still there? Yes. OK, okay. Dr. Sukati, uh, I've come back to Rome, so don't be angry with me. But I, I really would like you to tell us if there is one priority uh, on which FAO will commit its, itself in the future, not 55, because you mentioned many, and actually many are part of the global manifesto. But if there's one priority where you feel that the FAO could really put its, its weight in the future, you feel so something real, not something hypothetical, which one would be this priority? Yeah. To advance, of course, the cause of forgotten foods. Well, thank you. Uh... As, uh, as, as probably a lot of colleagues are aware, FAO is a, is a, is a technical organization So uh, uh, by its nature. So one priority that we, 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 will, we, we, we are sure of, we will, uh, we will engage with partnership. Uh, we, we are there to engage with partnership and promoting advocacy for these crops. Far right here, has been earmarked, has, has been chosen as one of our partners. We will work with them 
and partner with them with, we, in whatever initi in, initiative they want to take in research and in advocacy, we are there for them in, cre in creating platforms for promoting the traditional foods and whatever we want to call them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Carlo, um, there is obviously a need for a new science, a new way of building knowledge. Right, and you are, you know, director of a of a scientific research center. And how would you define, and again, not hypothetical, but in concrete terms, this new way of of generating knowledge that is needed when we work on forgotten foods? Yes, thank you. I I think it's relatively straightforward. We call them forgotten because science is not investing on them. And who has the knowledge about these crops? Yeah, are the farmers. So we need to really participate, listen, and learn from that knowledge to be able to advance. So one element is participatory. The second, just if you allow me to do a little bit of publicity to my last paper, we did a very sophisticated breed, wheat breeding program, major crop, etc. And we asked farmers to come and evaluate the result of the breeding. It was about 1,200 uh, lines that we developed in this program. We did the, the genetics, we did the agromorphology, quantitative, etc. And then we created the model for predicting yield. And, and then we compared the model that we used using our quantitative data with the farmer's prediction. And mm. guess which one was predicting, was more accurate in predicting yield, was the farmers. We need to understand that the, that the farmers are experts and they should be completely involved in the research and it should be really a kind of almost equal uh, research and that's the way to transform and if we can convince the national agricultural research organization the CGIER the international ones to really engage and ensure that that knowledge can be captured in research programs I think we've been doing the revolution you were talking about Wow, that's great. Thanks a lot. And the last question, uh, Wally, is for you, although you've been organizing and you, it's the worst question, because you have one of the most difficult uh, tasks, which is coordinating across Africa all these emerging initiatives, whether it's in Ghana, in Kenya, or elsewhere. It's a world of small changes that are occurring, and you don't have a radar, and I suppose you don't have the budget to travel across the whole of Africa and explore country by country what is being made. So how is FARA going to address this huge challenge of capturing, and I don't like the word capturing, let's say uh, getting to know uh, the diversity of initiatives that exist and understanding how to support them. How do you think you, you are going to make it? Yes. Well, you don't want me to look at the time again, but I think it is now seven minutes to go. So I need to do all this in, in less than two minutes. Okay. We need resources to be able to push this off the ground. The enthusiasm um, is high and private sector enclave are keenly interested, the women group, the ah. youth group, and, and some cooperatives are also um, keen to. So we need, like, what we need is a trigger, <clears throat> something to just trigger the action. And when the result comes out, everybody picks it up. Time will not allow me to talk about things like that. Nigeria um, gave itself back to wheat production. Yeah, I mean, using some of our patches, to, to produce wheat production. Outside using wheat for bread and all those things, Nigeria has no use wheat. When the millers in Nigeria rejected Nigerian grown wheat, you discover now that they now use wheat in Nigeria to produce things like um, ugali. And it is now very popular in household. Now, how did that happen? It happened because wheat is there, some people walked into it and they discovered that it, was, uh, it, it makes very good, um, you, you know, meal. And then they began to promote it. Local promotion, I mean, set this apart. The trigger that I think we need 
is to promote people that are already doing this, good publicity, good publicity. When we push that in their country, it begin, it begin to get traction. When we get champions to promote this, champion, and I, I, I mean celebrities, high level ministers, it goes a long way and you begin to see that the demand increases, farmers can produce. And that responds to what Professor Idowu said, that don't, don't behave like the conventional, establish the demand and let the farmers respond to it. But, but the bottom line is uh, we need the resources to do that because it's, it's a bit difficult to get the private sector to push that it's like a public uh, um, public action. So principal thing is publicity for now. Okay, let me push it on. Okay. Then uh, Bunsu, Bunsu crop research. You know Bunsu? Yeah. Mm. They started bringing out the old, 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 old crops and they were planting it. So I don't know if we can start and see some of them, we can get it there. So we can continue for they have so many goals. Thank you very much. Uh, we will close here, but I'd just like you really to pick up on your last observation, not so much what you said, but the way you said it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is pride related to forgotten foods. Yeah. And that is so important, I think, because pride is energy. Yeah. And I think it's great time, it's high time. I mean, so what you say to make Africa great again. I mean, for me, Africa has always been great. So it's not to make it great again, but it's true that we, and I actually it's a lot, we, because I'm a white man, oh. we have made Africa believe it is not great. Mm. And I think part of that belief is also through uh, exporting to Africa solutions that are not African. Mm. So I think, you know, if we move back to this energy and to the self-recognition by Africans that they hold the key, not to everything, not maybe to the nuclear energy, yeah. maybe, so one day, even to that one, I call, even if it was a good thing, but certainly they hold the key to, to good nutrition, to healthy nutrition. Maybe we have the key to development because to me, the, really the, the underdevelopment, the, the mechanism of underdevelopment starts with not believing in oneself. Yes. So I would like to conclude with this, which is linked to my initial point, forgotten foods, forgotten people, forgotten knowledge. If through forgotten food, we can start having Africans believing in themselves, believing in their tradition, believing in their culture, believing in their food, believing in their farming systems. We might have gone out of colonization or of new colonization, which is this certainly... should be treated immediately, young people. <laughs> okay, on these words, if you allow me, we close the meeting. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.